Welcome viewers to the 15th lecture of the series for an helical gear cutting. Last time when we met for the, uh, this series of lectures, we were discussing about uh, gear shapers and we solved some numerical problems and multiple choice questions regarding gear shapers. So, uh, in case of gear shapers, we have discussed uh, about spur gear cutting, about locations of uh, gear boxes and calculations of gear ratios and several multiple choice questions on different aspects of the problem. We also discussed that just one moment about certain machine elements of which one of them I would like to show here. This is a spline shaft with some gears mounted on top. See, it is rotation, rotation wise they are moving together, but the moment you move one with respect to each other, yeah, see actually they are movable with respect to each other. These are called the spline shafts, just a moment, can we have it once again, yeah. The sp see the axial movement is you know one is free from each other, but rotation wise they are locked with each other. If one has to rotate, the other has to rotate with it. Okay. So, uh, I will I will try to upload several of these clips uh, without including them in the lecture because lecture time is precious for us. Only ten hours of lectures do we have. Therefore, uh, several clips I will try to you know collect together and uh, put it on the for forum so that everybody can uh, open them and see them at your uh, during your spare time. So. To start with, once again, let's let's move back to the start of the fifteenth lecture. So, at that time, we were discussing uh, what about helical gear cutting in case of shapers. In in case of shapers, there's an advantage. What's the advantage? The advantage is that in case of gear shaping, we we require very little approach and over travel. So that means if you have a look at this particular figure, suppose there is one gear, this is the blank and you would like to have movement of the cutter from basically this point to this point, the cutter cannot move beyond. So, in case of that the gear shaper cutter is you know quite useful, this is the gear shaper cutter and it can move from this side to that side. Okay. Just this much motion is sufficient for us. On the other hand, so that, that means it is reciprocating if we if you kindly remember it is reciprocating, but if you have the hob cutter, we will come to the hob cutter or the milling cutter it has to start from somewhere here and it has to end up somewhere here. That is it has to move through this particular tooth and hence if you have a configuration in which there is a gear right beside a shoulder say this is a shoulder and there has to be say helical teeth cut on this one. You have a problem with milling or you have a problem with you know other other methods of gear cutting, but in case of shaping you can move this way. But in shaping the problem is the cutter moves up and down in this manner okay? and for that you need a physical guide, you need a different type of cutter and all these things add up money wise they become very expensive. So, that for a particular helix angle if you require a particular uh, cutter and a particular guide mechanical guide it becomes a king's ransom okay, to have the full set and that is why when we discuss uh, gear hobbing uh, especially the aspect of helical uh, cutting of gears uh, during that I will make a comparative study. So, that you will be convinced yes uh, for, for helical gear cutting gear hobbing is the answer okay. gear hobbing is the answer not gear shaping. So, this thing we have already discussed. So, let us go back. 
So uh, let's come back to generation. We were discussing about generation and uh, with respect to generation we have already had uh, a discussion on gear shaping which is based on generation. What does it utilize? It use, utilizes a pinion cutter that means a cutter shaped like a gear okay? and it is rolling against the blank and ultimately converting it to a fully made functional gear. Now comes the question that in that particular gear cutter that means shaper shaping machine gear cutter there is still one problem what is that let us have a quick look at that in this figure. The shaper cutter is going to have the exact profile of a gear of that number of teeth those many number of that many number of teeth and that particular module. Okay. So, that means this particular profile has to be an involute say in case of involute gears say 20 degree involute. So, the problem still remains to some, uh, uh, to some extent if you are interested to cut gears by gear shaping you have to have a cutter which have has a perfect and complex curved form which are difficult to produce. Okay. So, we are talking about difficulty in producing complex curved surfaces and that is exactly what we are coming across in case of gear shaping. The pinion cutter has to have a curved periphery, it has to be extremely accurate because it is giving rise to you know subsequent gear gears from the blanks and therefore, we still have a problem we have to manufacture this particular complex profile. So, that immediately gives us an idea that if we consider the basic rack which is fitting with you know these teeth, the rack has an advantage over this. If we can have the cutting element in the form of a rack, it is going to have a very simple profile. Okay. This profile is going to be extremely simple, it is a straight line, okay. it is angled, but how does that matter? It is a straight line, it will be easy to produce this. Okay? But the problem is if we make this particular say this gear is meshing with this particular rack and again we have a problem. What is that problem? If we make this the cutter and if we make this the work piece that means a blank which is getting machined into the form of a gear then of course we will be giving providing all the motions this is rolling against this one these two motions have been have been provided the rack has to move up and down you know that reciprocation etc and all the other things like this has to have radial in feed and this has to have the relieving motion all that can be provided but the main problem is that while the rack is moving from one side to the other, since it has to be a finite length, at one time you will find that there are no more teeth left on the rack, it has moved completely to this side, okay. this particular border has come to this particular portion and there are no more teeth left on this side. So, in that case there are solutions like in the rack cutting attachment, uh, sorry in uh, there is most probably if I remember correctly Matterson's uh, gear shaper with a cutting element as a rack. Okay. You can have it mounted on a chain so one after the other these are coming and then they are you know getting recirculated. Okay. The problem is it is not one complete rigid body and therefore, there will be, uh, will be uh, subtle changes in position which will give rise to errors. So, these errors give rise to inaccuracies in the workpiece and that should be uh, by all means av uh, avoided. Okay. So, how can we have a rack which remains you know always with available teeth for cutting yet it moves just imagine endless rack with that idea in mind we will you know we can hit upon or rather uh, metal cutting scientists hit upon this idea that fine have a rack
have a rack, have the uh, you know virtual workpiece here. etc. And in order to make this endless, why do not you employ a threaded element? Remember in our childhood days, we used to make a very interesting uh, game with ourselves, you know you with yourself. What was that game? If you go on rotating, if you go on rotating a threaded member, this sort of a threaded member. If you go on rotating this, you know, holding this one and rotating a threaded member, it would seem as if a wave was passing from one side to the other. Okay, I will, I will definitely introduce a clip in which you will be seeing this. You have done it so many times, I am sure, in your childhood days. That is, a threaded member when it is rotated, it would appear to have a wave. That means just like a rack movement from one side to the other. So, if you rotate a threaded member, it would be just as a rack and that that to an endless rack connected to the workpiece. So, this gives us an idea why do not we employ the warm and warm gear arrangement to act as the cutting element and the cut element. Okay. So, this will be the warm and this will be the warm gear. We will put the blank here, so that a gear would be cut instead of the warm gear. And we would we will put the cutter here, which will look like a warm, but we will produce cutting edges on it. So, this is the idea. I want I wanted the rack. The rack has straight sides, but the rack has finite length. So, I replace it with a screw, okay, a thread, threaded element with the same cross section as that of the rack. So, I still have those straight sides which are easy to produce and by rotation, by virtue of rotation, the endless rack is produced here and the only thing which is left is that I have to, you know, bestow upon this particular worm cutting ability. Cutting ability has to be given to this worm because ordinarily this screw thread has no cutting edges. It cannot cut like a milling cutter. So, I have to make it a cutter. A worm with cutting edges is called a hob and the process which follows will be called gear hobbing. So, let us have a look. This is it. Okay. The blank will be moving this way and the and the, and the worm will be moving this way and this worm will be converted to a cutter by making some gashes uh, in it, longitudinal gashes. Let us see how it is. This is the longitudinal gash. Longitudinal gash means you are removing the whatever material is there to form sharp edges both on this side and that side. How would it look like? It would look somewhat like this. This is the continuous thread and this is the thread cut open and this portion is removed, so that you have sharp edges existing here. How does it look like from the end? It would look somewhat like this. Okay. Longitudinal gash is made here, one here, one there that means one on some place here, one on the other side which we cannot see and one on this side. These are the longitudinal gashes that we have made it opens up cutting edges. This is one cutting edge, okay. a series of those interrupted teeth which are going to have sharp edges. However, there is yet another thing that we have done here in order to turn it into a cutter looking like a milling cutter from the end. Let us have a look. Basically, if you see it on the piece of paper, this is the This is the worm to a uh, worm seen from one end. The longitudinal gash opens up these portions. However, if you use this as a cutter, there is a problem. What is that problem? The whole 
outer periphery which is on the circumference of a single circle okay about i mean if you rotate about this all these points will be at the same radius and if you try to cut something with this one all these points will rub against the finished surface which is not desirable so we put some sort of you know relief here and cut away these portions maybe Archimedean spiral or logarithm spiral just like in case of uh, form relieved cutters in milling. And now, if you rotate it this way, it will be capable of removing material by cutting. So, this is gone. This was also gone. So, this makes us the particular hob cross section. So, it is capable of removing material now. Once we have this sort of a cutter, it still maintains the speed ratio with the work piece. Okay. That means, that if you give it, give it a fully formed gear, it will connect up with that particular gear and establish a particular uh, definite speed ratio depend uh, equal to k by z, where k is the number of starts, okay, k by z, where k is the number of starts on the worm and z is the number of teeth on the worm gear. We have already discussed this so many times. So, it still has a uh, perfect speed ratio with a fully formed gear. That means, if we now provide this with a speed and uh, a blank with a speed exactly uh, in, in, in the inverse ratio of k by z okay, and make it move across the cylindrical surface of the workpiece or blank, we will get teeth cut by the method of generation. Okay. Let us have a look how it works. This is the figure. Now, I have replaced the hob profile by a cylinder, because now you have the idea how it is made. And this is the blank. So, if I provide rotation as if this is a fully formed worm gear, and this is a, this is still a worm, they will have the speed ratio that they were supposed to have if they had been formed in worm gear. At the same time, I am moving the hob across the face from the top to the bottom of the blank with of course, the interference that means, with a depth of cut equal to the total depth of teeth. In that case, I will find that teeth are going to form on the periphery of the workpiece. The workpiece is moving okay, and the hob is moving down very slowly past the face of the blank the blank or the workpiece moves, the hob also rotates at a much faster rate and takes away material from the periphery. So, that you will find initially, initially if this be the workpiece and if this be the hob in the beginning. Okay. So, this one is rotating fast this one is rotating slowly and initially it will make small you know cuts on the part small cuts will appear next the hob is continuously going down and these cuts will be you know extended after a few more rotations you will find achha, the cuts are now extended this way, it goes on going deeper and deeper that means, down in depth and these teeth start getting the full profile this way, maybe up till this point first. And that way, so all of them start getting extended in this direction and ultimately, they will be fully cut 
when the worm has when the hob has completely passed beyond okay so this way all of them start getting the cuts and all of them get extended vertically downwards why vertically downwards because they are exactly matched okay they are exactly matched by the property on, of worm and worm gear so this is removing all the material it finds on its way which does not belong to the worm gear okay just the method of generation that is uh, it, it, it is removing all the material so that the conjugate profile which is formed is nothing but this particular worm gear in our case a fully formed gear okay so these teeth will be formed i will definitely uh, include a clip of this one you can see it by opening it up so this way the uh, you know the the teeth are formed and 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 uh, the the hob from the top to the bottom it moves if you move too fast these teeth are going to be rough if you move too slow it's going to take a lot of time but the surface will be quite smooth so this downward movement defines the feed so this is the feed motion what about the circular motion of the workpiece this defines the indexing motion okay with respect to the hob speed it defines how many teeth you are going to cut remember the ratio of the cutter rotation to the workpiece rotation will define the number of teeth being cut what about the hob rotation the hob rotation defines the cutting speed okay the hob rotation defines the cutting speed now you will notice that when we are cutting a spur gear then typically the hob will be inclined at an angle okay you are cutting teeth like this and you will find that the hob is typically inclined at an angle you might say why should the hob be inclined because please remember please recall that when we are cutting when we are engaging the worm gear with the worm okay we draw figures like these in that case the worm has a particular thread so definitely this but uh, the thread has a particular helix angle this helix angle on the other side has to match okay this one has to match this one has to match with the teeth on the worm gear so ordinarily the worm gear teeth will be slightly inclined worm gear teeth will be slightly inclined if they are supposed to be you know straight so if you are interested to cut straight teeth in that case you have to make the uh, the the worm teeth parallel to this direction so these are the worm teeth now like that so if you keep the worm straight the teeth of the worm gear has to be have to be inclined so the worm has to be inclined somewhat in order to get straight teeth okay so we will be learning more of this when we discuss helical hobbing so we learn that the worm needs to be rotated and inclined at an angle the worm or the hob the worm with cutting edges has to have rotatory motion to develop cutting speed the workpiece has to rotate in order to get indexing motion and the hob has to be fed vertically downwards in order to have feed motion you might say is this the only possible configuration for hobbing answer is no there can be other methods but this is one of the most common methods by which hobbing is done now let's have a quick look at the configuration that means the machine layout what do i mean by the machine layout just as before when we were discussing shapers we noticed 
that in case of shapers you have to provide the machine with a certain amount of versatility. So, that not only can it handle different numbers of teeth it can be run at different values of cutting speed it can be run at uh, you, it can be run so as to provide different numbers of teeth and it can be uh, run so as to provide different uh, you know uh, surface roughness values in, in order to it can be run to impart different surface finish values on the workpiece surface in order to provide that versatility we incorporate gear boxes with the help of which you can have different values of these parameters cutting speed, number of teeth, surface finish and of course, at the final stage different helix angles, different helix angles. Okay. Let us see this next one. This is the configuration which is proposed for the different gear boxes. So, first of all this is the preliminary case in which up till now we are not considering helical machining that means uh, cutting off helical gears. So, what do we have here to start with we have a single motor from that single motor we are having the speed gear box. So, please note instead of writing u v as the gear boxes are uh, represented by very small boxes we could not accommodate u v. So, we have written v. So, v stands for speed gear box, i stands for index gear box and s stands for feed gear box. As we have discussed in case of shapers the gear boxes have the same functions u v is supposed to control the cutting speed, u i is supposed to control the number of teeth being cut, u s is supposed to control the feed in millimeters per revolution of work piece. That means, how many millimeters of hop movement will take place vertically downwards by the time that the blank rotates once. Okay. So, we understand that there are three gear boxes and these three gear boxes are having these three functions. Now, once again just like shaping machine I mean gear shaper let us have a quick look whether the positions that we have suggested for these gear boxes whether these locations are unique or there can be other configurations also which would serve, serve the same purpose. So, uh, what is this? Uh, we will come to this one a little later. So, let us see this is the position that we started with and I am taking a different configuration. If you remember the simple rules of hobbing that we had sorry simple rules of gear boxes that we had you know uh, stated and accepted the last day it was that the change in one gear box should only affect the parameter it is intended to change it should not affect any other parameters. Okay. So, it means basically one gear box when it is changed it should affect only one parameter and it should not affect other parameters. Okay. So, with that in mind let us have a look at this particular configuration. What has been changed here? I have shifted the position of i from this point to this point. What is i supposed to do? i is supposed to change the number of teeth being cut. So, first of all <coughs> let us first uh, see uh, what was the previous position and how it was serving its purpose. Generally the number of teeth being cut will be decided by the rpm ratio of the hob and the blank. So, let us quickly see what are the machine elements which are in that particular loop. So, starting from the hob rotation I start from the hob rotation here hob is rotating 
okay and then this is the path and the blank is rotating okay this is the path if anything lies in this path if it is changed it is it is going to affect the uh, rotational ratio between hob and the blank and that will change the number of teeth so if you look at the previous case in the previous case also i was there in the loop and in the present case i is still there in the loop only it has shifted from one position to another let us see this one and this one okay these are the two locations that we are talking of so we are saying this is sorry we are saying this is acceptable while this is not so let's see what is going wrong here if i is placed here and suppose you change the value of i to get a different uh, rpm ratio unfortunately as it is just ahead of the hob it will change the rpm of the hob as well and you will start getting a different cutting speed and that is not uh, acceptable as it is going against the basic law of you know uh, mutual mutually exclusive function of gearboxes the gearboxes should function in a mutually exclusive manner so that is being transgressed okay so uh, with this we come to the end of the 15th lecture we will again take up the uh, same discussion that we will pick up the threads in the next lecture thank you very much